So what? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, good, good, yes. Sometimes my watch uh, falls behind, but my watch is uh, just a couple minutes behind. So yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's spend um, what time we have left today to talk about the papacy from its zenith through its decline. The last time we left the papacy, uh, uh, Gregory the Seventh was uh, was uh, the Pope and was in conflict with uh, Henry the Fourth over lay investiture. All right, so we have this conflict between <coughs> church and state. Urban the Second was calling for the uh, uh, the First Crusade. Gregory and Urban marked the end of the Gregorian reform, but they also marked the beginning of the ascendancy of papal power. When we see Gregory the Seventh opposing Henry the Henry the Fourth. Although I mean at first he had success in his opposition to Henry. Ultimately of course he was uh, he had to flee in front of Henry's army, but he had some success uh, in imposing his will against the Holy Roman Empire. Urban the Second showed the power of his papacy by calling uh, for the uh, for the Crusades. And so from here we see uh, the continued rise of the uh, political power and influence of the popes. Continuing conflict between the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Frederick the uh, First, Frederick Barbarossa, whom we just talked about uh, as uh, as leading one of the Crusades and, and dying during it. He had supported a series of, of anti-popes. Uh, he uh, opposed uh, the uh, Pope Alexander III. The allegiances of Europe were divided, but ultimately malaria defeated Frederick, and so uh, uh, he had he was forced to submit to uh, Alexander III. So Alexander III uh, dominates Frederick I. All right, Alexander III is involved in a conflict in England between uh, Thomas Becket, who is Archbishop of Canterbury, and King Henry II. Uh, an interesting story uh, about Thomas Becket. He had began uh, his uh, career as a friend of Henry II and as Chancellor of England. But then when the Archbishop of Canterbury died, Henry II had a great idea. I'm going to appoint my friend Thomas as Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, then my friend Thomas will have the political authority of his position as Chancellor and the religious authority in his position as the Archbishop <coughs> of Canterbury. Well, it didn't work out like that, because once Thomas Becket became Archbishop, he was overwhelmed by his sense of responsibility to the church. Okay? And so uh, he resigned as chancellor and then he began to oppose Henry in matters where the state infringed upon uh, the authority of the church. One such area was uh, the, uh, the authority in ecclesiastical trials. If a clergyman uh, committed a crime uh, Thomas insisted that the trial would be held in the church. Henry wanted to try the clergy in royal courts, so Henry passed the Constitution of Clarendon to enforce uh, the state's authority over the clergy. Well, uh, Thomas denounced Clarendon. Uh, Henry then falsely accused Thomas of embezzlement during his time as chancellor, and so Thomas then was forced to flee England and uh, uh, went to France, and there he appealed to Alexander. Well, Alexander uh, really wasn't that supportive of Thomas, uh, but he did uh, negotiate for his return. But then when Thomas returned, he found that many of the bishops uh, in England had uh, capitulated to Henry, and so Thomas excommunicated them. And so Thomas returns to England, after his exile, but he still is uh, belligerent in his opposition to Henry. Henry, exasperated by Thomas's stubbornness, 
uh, in a public gathering said, Who will rid me of this monk? Well, four of his knights overheard him say this, and thinking that he meant it literally, they took it upon themselves to ride through the night and find Thomas uh, uh, performing mass uh, at Canterbury uh, on uh, December 29th in 1170, and they uh, murdered him right there at the altar. So, uh, after this, Henry was put in a terrible position because his knights, acting supposedly on his orders, had murdered uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so the Pope then uh, was able to use his authority to demand that Henry repent. And uh, Henry indeed had to publicly uh, take off his robes and receive a whipping uh, as, uh, as penance for his crime. And then I was also uh, uh, forced to concede the rights of the ecclesiastical trials to church. And so, uh, so thus that conflict between church and state was resolved. And 1173, uh, Thomas <coughs> Beckett was canonized as a saint. Uh, in your, in your uh, course documents, you'll find that there are some uh, pictures uh, of Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, one of my students, Angela Nugent, uh, now Angela Reed. Angela took some pictures and I posted them there. There's also a brief biography of that is written by a friend of mine, Samuel Nam. Uh, those, uh, uh, those resources are actually put there, uh, as well, at least the biography is put there for my online students that have to write a review of, of the movie Beckett, but you can take advantage of them as well. All right, other events in uh, the life and ministry of Alexander III include uh, plenary indulgences that were offered for those who took up arms against heretics. So, in other words, uh, no longer were the Crusades only focused on the East now they were focused on heretics in southern France. So we're, we're using the, 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 the power of the papacy, the, uh, the granting of plenary indulgences in France, and this is going to lead the way for the Inquisition, and I believe we'll get to that uh, next week. And then we have a change in the way that, uh, uh, that the popes are elected. They'll be elected by the cardinals. Well, there's I really there are a couple of things I really want to uh, to get to. So let's move quickly. Uh, Innocent the Third is considered the zenith of the papacy because uh, of the dominance, his dominance over church and state. And you'll see a number of of, uh, of influences there uh, listed for you. Uh, other events in his uh, in his his life, he uh, uh, sent the Crusade, the Fourth Crusade against Egypt. We've already discussed that. Uh, then we have the Fourth Lateran Council taking place in 1215. And remember, 1215 is uh, the date that we usually assign to the conclusion of uh, the, the middle uh, period of the Middle Ages and the beginning of a high period of the Middle Ages. 1215 is an important year because of the Fourth Lateran Council and because it represents uh, Innocent III, this zenith of papal power. All right, he called for the Fifth Crusade, which happened after his death, strengthened the Inquisition against heresies. It was during uh, uh, his uh, reign that we had the establishment of the Franciscans and Dominicans, about whom we'll talk later. He mandated schools for every cathedral. This is important because it made education uh, available not only at monasteries but also at cathedrals required Jews and Muslims to wear distinctive dress. All right, and this was in reaction to the Pact of Umar. Remember when we talked about the, the spread of Islam, we talked about how the Muslims required some distinctive signs from Jews and Christians. Well, this did the same uh, to Jews and Muslims. And then they created a dogma where there's, uh, it required a confession at least once a year. Uh, it outlined seven sacraments, and then it, it, uh, it legalized the doctrine of transubstantiation, about which we've talked several times. All right, that's the Fourth Lateran Council. Innocent III was the first pope to refer to himself as the Vicar of Christ. 
that is the representative of Christ, saying that uh, priests have power in earth. They have power over the soul, and uh, they also have power over the monarchy. All right, the next major pope came at the end of uh, the 13th century, and that was Boniface VIII. Boniface uh, VIII has, a, has an interesting story that, uh, that I must uh, tell you um, because uh, of, his, of his predecessor. His predecessor was Peter of Moroni, and Peter was a hermit who lived in a cave uh, in a mountain close to Naples, Italy. And uh, when it came time to uh, elect the Pope, uh, the, uh, the cardinals uh, uh, felt that uh, they wanted someone especially spiritual and holy to be the next Pope. And so um, the, uh, the cardinals decided on Peter of Moroni. So they, uh, they actually went to his cave and convinced him to leave his cave and to be the Pope. But he wouldn't come to Rome. Instead, he went to, uh, to, to Naples and lived in the palace of the king of Naples. But even though he was Pope, he still wanted to live like a monk. And so he had a, a, a cell built in the palace. And from there, he, uh, he, he tried to run the church. Well, obviously, uh, coming out of, uh, of, of a very simplistic lifestyle, he was incapable of running what the church had become in terms of its uh, union with church and state, its wealth, its power. Uh, and so uh, the cardinals were very uh, dismayed about his inept uh, rule. Well, there was a cardinal named Benedict Gaetani who uh, took it upon himself to do something about this inept pope. And so he created a speaking tube, and at night he would insert it into the cell where uh, uh, the pope, who's named Celestine V, where Pope Celestine was sleeping. And so he'd speak into the tube and say, abdicate, abdicate, or suffer the flames of hell. So he did this. Uh, you know, several nights in a row, and finally Celestine got the idea that God was telling him to abdicate. And so only 15 weeks later, uh, he abdicated the papacy. This is important in history because this is the last pope to abdicate voluntarily until Benedict XVI this century. Okay? I mean, like this year. All right, so, uh, so uh, he abdicated. Well, ten days later, guess who the cardinals elected to be pope? Benedict Gaetani. And so uh, he became uh, Pope Boniface VIII. Um, now, when he went, uh, for his coronation, he rode upon a white horse. Uh, his pomp was a stark contrast to Celestine's humility. His first acts were to rescind all of Celestine's orders and to arrest Celestine. So he put him in prison, and then Celestine said this to Boniface, you have entered like a fox, you will reign like a lion, you will die like a dog. And that's just about what happened. Um, Benedict uh, uh, got, in, got involved in a war between Edward I of England and Philip IV uh, of France, uh, and uh, uh, he forbade clergy to contribute to uh, the, the kings for their war. He delivered this, uh, this, uh, this edict, Unum Sanctum, uh, which, uh, which said that the Christ's two swords were under the Pope's control. If you look at Luke 2, 38, it's the passage in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Jesus says, uh, take up your sword, and Peter said, here we have two swords, that's enough. Well, the spiritual sword was wielded by the Pope. The temporal sword was wielded by the magistrate, but the temporal sword was subservient to the church. He was not able to enforce this kind of papal power, but that was his, his intent. Well, he abused his power by taking money uh, for positions. He placed members of his family in high positions. Ultimately, Philip 
uh, in retaliation uh, had Boniface kidnapped and humiliated, uh, tortured. Uh, he was uh, ridden through the city backwards. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when he was released, shortly after that he died, and Philip spread the rumor that he committed suicide. Um, so he died like a dog. His arrogant over-assertion of papal power set the stage for the next two uh, uh, embarrassing, humiliating, corrupt periods of, uh, of the papacy, the Avignon papacy and the papal schism. So, as we saw, Gregory VII began the ascent, Innocent III reached the zenith, and Boniface VIII descended the foothills of papal power. Okay, um, very quickly, uh, because we're nearly out of time, but I do want to take a few minutes to talk about the Avignon Papacy, which lasted from 1305 to 1377, so about 70 years. Therefore, it's called the Babylonian Captivity of the Church because you'll remember that when Israel was held captive, it was for uh, 70 years. Uh, after um, after uh, Boniface's death, uh, his friend became pope for a very short period of time, and then after that, Philip IV was able to dominate uh, the College of Cardinals and elect Pope Clement V. And Clement was a subject of Philip, <coughs> and Philip convinced Clement to be crowned in France and Clement remained in France, and his successors remained in France for over 70 years. So instead of being in Rome, the papacy was headquartered in France. And so Europe uh, looked at the papacy and considered it to be a tool of France. So all nations who were at war with France also considered themselves to be enemies of the church. There was shameless immorality uh, at the papal court and greed, and so uh, that's part of the demand for uh, reform. It was during this period of time that Catherine of Siena uh, uh, came to prominence, a Dominican laywoman, a mystic. She was, she was an active correspondent with popes and with kings, was involved with the Avignon papacy and the papal schism, uh, and, uh, and begged the popes to return uh, to Rome. Uh, Lakin wrote her paper on Catherine of Siena, and I'm sorry, Lakin, that we don't have time for you to, to, uh, to, 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 well, this is really all that we've got time to do, uh, other than to say that we have more information. Uh, please look at it, because Catherine of Siena is a fascinating individual. Well, finally, 1377, Gregory XI returned the papacy, uh, to Rome, but, uh, there was, there was little, peace to enjoy uh, after that. Gregory died. The next pope was Urban VI. Uh, he was a zealous reformer, but he was tactless. And when he tried to end the, uh, the, the payment uh, for uh, positions, the cardinals uh, rebelled because uh, it affected their income and it alienated most of them. So many of the cardinals uh, gathered again and uh, rejected Urban and elected another pope who took the name Clement VII. And you can tell by the fact that he took the name Clement that he was going to follow the pattern of Clement V and Clement VII reigned in Avignon while Urban VI continued to reign in Rome. Well, they had successive popes uh, that uh, divided the papacy between Avignon and Rome. Uh, and uh, each papacy supported by different uh, nations. Finally, the church called for a council to heal the schism and to reform the church. The Council of Pisa met in 1409, and uh, they, uh, instead of deciding between one or another, they deposed both and elected a third. So now, instead of having two popes, we have three popes. The Council of Constance finally ended the schism with the election of Martin V. When Martin V was elected, the Pope that represented Rome resigned. And that is the last Pope to resign. He did not resign willingly, uh, as did Celestine, but he's the last one to resign until Benedict, Benedictine. I'm sorry, Benedict.
the sick. All right, so I, I kind of wanted to be sure that I mentioned the, the, the precedence uh, of, of Benedict, which is not much. Um, so the Council of Constance brought about the end of, um, of the, uh, the, the papal schism. Well, all right, we will uh, uh, please go ahead and read through the, uh, the Renaissance popes. Um, we'll have occasion to talk about them uh, again a little bit uh, later when we get to the Renaissance.